الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خير خلق الله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين جزاك الله خيرا اللهم جعلنا ممن تبعهم بإحسان اللهم آمين ما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته جزاكم الله خيرا and, and welcome to all of you مرحبا بكم to our masjid and um, it's very uh, we're very honored to have you all here جزاكم الله خيرا and we have a noble guest with us uh, all the way from London may Allah reward him for each uh, centimeter you came اللهم آمين and Allah was to benefit from his lecture titled having hope in Allah سبحانه وتعالى so uh, without further delay let us benefit from the sheikh فجزاه uh, عنا خير الجزاء جزاكم الله خيرا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام الأتمان الأكملان على خير خلق الله أجمعين وعلى آله وأصحابه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما تنفعنا به يا رب العالمين وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته It's a great pleasure to be back at Masjid Al-Furqan and to see the same radiant faces and to see new faces as well that are also radiant, mashallah. And to be in such a vibe and atmosphere that I personally haven't seen many masajid possess. Each and every single time I come to Masjid Al-Furqan, there's just something about it from the moment you come through the door until you leave again through the door. You're greeted, you're welcomed, you're honored, you're shown a lot of respect. And it is from the imams to the staff members, to the community, to the children, the adults, every single person. When I came in today, I came from London and the first place I went to was to, do, to make wudu in order for me to pray Salat al-Asr. And then somebody just gave me a hug outside the toilet. Uh, I said, outside the toilet, hatta even outside the toilet. So this is the khair that is in this masjid. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to increase you all in it. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it something which is heavy on your scales on the day of judgment. As for the muhadara or the lecture, then it has been entitled having hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as we all know from the authentic hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in At-Tirmidhi, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he mentions that the average age range or lifespan of the followers of this ummah is between 60 and 70 years old. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says only a few people will exceed that bound. Not many people from this ummah are going to live beyond 70 years old. And this becomes very, very clear when we look at the other hadith of the Prophet ﷺ in Sahih Muslim. The Prophet ﷺ, he says, يُؤْتَى بِأَنْعَمِ أَهْلِ الدُّنْيَا مِنْ أَهْلِ النَّارِ The person who lived the most luxurious life in this world, but was destined to be from the people of the fire, he will be summoned on the day of judgment. He lived a luxurious life. Nobody lived a life like him. Every single thing that he wanted, every single door that he knocked on, every single dream that he had, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave every single thing that he wanted and he gave him more. Yutabi an'ami ahli dunya min ahli jannah. Or yutabi an'ami ahli dunya min ahli nar. But he's from the people of the fire. What happens to this person? He will be dipped into the hellfire one time. He's not going to be in there for a few seconds or a few minutes. A dip, ya akhi. Dip in and out. Then he will be asked, Have you ever seen any na'im? Have you ever seen any bliss? Have you ever seen any good? Have you ever seen any luxuries? And he was the guy who lived the most luxurious life. That one dip in Jahannam will make him say, La wallahi la. Never. By Allah, no. I haven't seen any good. This guy is the guy who lived the best life. He says, no, I haven't seen anything. The Prophet ﷺ, he says the opposite as well. That the person who lived the most difficult life in this world, 
but he was destined to be from the people of Jannah. This person will be brought as well and he will be dipped in Jannah just one time. He will be taken into Jannah and taken out. And then he will be asked, did you see any difficulty and hardship? Do you remember anything that was difficult in your life when you were in the dunya? And he'll say the same thing, La, wallahi la. No, I don't remember seeing any hardship. One second in Jannah made him forget everything. One second in Jannah made him forget all of the struggles, all of the difficulties, all of the hardship, all of the stress. And the same for the bad person or the one who lived a life, a chilled out life, a relaxed life. This person, he was placed in Jahannam for just one second, one moment. And he also forgot about all of the good that he had. When you come across reports like this, this makes you understand the reality of this world. That number one, it's nothing but a few moments. Like a lot of the Salaf, they would say, this world, it is just two days. The whole world is two days. Does anybody know from the Shabab? If we say the whole world is two days, what do we mean? You guys tell me around here. What, what do I mean by two days? Tell me. You don't know. Have a try. What is your name first? Bahram. From where? Albania? Huh? Which country? Afghanistan. Pashto or Farsi? Allahu Akbar. MashaAllah. Bahram, huh? I actually have a friend called Bahram. He's in Afghanistan as well. Afghani. You don't know what two days means. Have a think. If I say to you, the whole dunya is two days, what does this mean? Hmm. Yeah. 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 It's going to go soon. Two days. Today, because you're living today. And tomorrow or yesterday? Yesterday. Tomorrow you don't know if it's going to come. There's two doubts regarding tomorrow. One doubt is, is tomorrow going to come? Is tomorrow going to come? Who knows for sure they're going to be here tomorrow? No one. So you don't know if tomorrow's coming and you don't know if you're going to be present if tomorrow does come. But then there's a day that is coming. It is fast approaching. It is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised. If Allah jalla wa ala makes a promise, he's not like the creation. The creation, they make promises. They break promises. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he makes a promise. He doesn't break it. Allah says, Indeed, the hour is fast approaching. It's coming quick. And there's no doubt that it's coming quick. But the majority of the people, they don't believe in it. The day of judgment is going to establish, is going to be established by Allah, just like any other day. Today is Saturday. Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. These are days that you are familiar with. But the believer who is al kayyis al-Fatin, the smart, intelligent believer, is the one who programs in his mind that there are eight days in the week. It's not seven days. Monday to Sunday, and then the eighth day, it is called Yom Al-Qiyamah. Because it's also a day. You are going to wake up like you normally wake up. But you are not going to wake up from your bed, you are going to wake up from your grave. You are not going to wake up wearing pajamas and you are not going to wake up wearing slippers and you are not going to wake up wearing a robe. You will wake up naked with no clothes. You will wake up barefoot with no shoes. You will wake up uncircumcised. You will march to the place of gathering and you will stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The angels will take you and they will throw you into the light of the nur of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's arsh and throne. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, Udnu minni ibn Adam. O son of Adam, come close to me. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will hold that conversation with you. You will be asked about every single thing that you did in your life. Every single thing that you intended to do in your life. Nothing will be left. Like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, the people will say on that day, وَيَقُولُونَ They will say, يَا وَيْلَتَنَا Woe be to us. مَا لِهَذَا الْكِتَابِ What is the matter with this book, this scroll of ours? لَا يُغَادِرُ صَغِيرَةً وَلَا كَبِيرَةً إِلَّا أَحْصَاهَا it doesn't leave anything out. It's encompassed everything. Everything which is small. Everything which is big. And subhanallah, the scholars of tafsir, they say, what's been mentioned first is everything which is small. لا يغادر صغيرة Small. ولا كبيرة And big. To show you that even the small things are going to be there. Everything is going to be there. إلا أحصاها Nothing small, nothing big, except that it has encompassed it. وَوَجَدُوا مَا عَمِلُوا حَاضِرًا 
and they will find everything that they did in the world present in front of them. And your Lord is not going to wrong any of you. Like the Prophet says in the other authentic report, a man who committed a life of haram and wrong, everything he did was bad. He didn't know good. He didn't know this word, let alone his action and what it stood for. This person will see Yawm Al-Qiyamah, he will see Yawm Al-Qiyamah, his scrolls, 99 scrolls of bad that he did, each one is Madd Al-Basar. It's as far as the eye can see. It will be said to him, you know, this is all your bad actions. You did all of that, right? He will admit it because of course he did it. He'll be asked, were you wronged by the angels? Did they record all of this and make the scroll this big? And they wronged you in the process? No, nobody wronged me. But this person, he believes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He had goodness in his heart. So what happened? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he destined for him to be from the people of Jannah. An envelope came and an envelope was placed on the scale. With the 99 bad deeds that he did filled with those scrolls, and then that one small envelope, it outweighed all of the 99 scrolls. The envelope was looked into. What does this envelope have? It had within it the statement of Tawheed. La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. He lived by it. He believed it. This was his slogan. And because of this, this led to his salvation. So I wanted to make this the introduction. When the individual, he understands the reality of the dunya and he understands the reality of the akhirah. Like, let's just take another step back. We began with this hadith about the age range of the ummah. The Prophet wasallam, he lived for 63 years. That's it. He didn't live a year more than that. And he's been underground for more than 1400 years. So his lifespan when he was in the dunya was 63 years. But has he spent more time Above the earth or more time beneath the earth? It's a question. Beneath the earth. You can't even compare the two. 63 and 1400 is a big difference. This is the Prophet ﷺ. What about the Ummah and the nations that came before? And how long are we going to be spending in this grave of ours? And then another question. After thinking about that, how is this grave of ours even going to be? Is it going to be rawdatan min riyad al-jannah? Or is it going to be hufratan min hufar al-nar? Wal-iyadu billah, wal-iyadu billah. Is it going to be a garden from the gardens of paradise? Or is it going to be a pit of fire? Are you going to be punished in the grave before you are punished in Jahannam? Or are you going to be placed in bliss? Bliss before you are placed into the bliss of Jannah. And this is what Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala he mentions when he comments on the ayah إِنَّ الْأَبَرَارَ لَفِي نَعِيمٍ Indeed the righteous believers they are in na'im and they are in bliss. Ibn al-Qayyim he says in all three stages. In the dunya, in the barzakh and in jannah. If you are a righteous person, you would have to live a good life here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you the best life. Because you are the one that's most entitled to a good life. You are the slave of Allah. And Allah Jalla wa Ala doesn't love anybody more than He loves you. So He's going to give you the best life. And then when you are in the grave, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will command the angels to tell you, have a qaylula and have a sleep and a rest until the day of judgment is going to come. A window is going to be open so you can see the view. In the dunya, you like seeing the view, right? And the attractions and going on top of a mountain and like the big mountains you guys have in Manchester, everyone comes to see it. In your grave, you will see a window where you can see Jannah, what's going on. And you'll be told, this is your palace. You're going to live there. Just, just a few more minutes, moments remain, you're going to be placed in there. The Prophet ﷺ speaks about it as well. He says, Indeed, the believer in Jannah will have a khaymah. He will have a tent. Do you know what he said? He says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, طُولُهَا فِي السَّمَاءِ سِتُونَ مِيلًا this tent, this building, this place, this settlement that they're going to have, its height, it is, how, how long? How much? 60 miles. You know, 60 miles, is not, it's not useful height, is it? It's useful. But this is explaining how high up it's going to be. The Prophet says in other supporting reports, it mentions that you can see outside, and the people inside, some reports say they can see you. Other reports say they won't be able to see you for your privacy. 
So you can see everybody. Imagine that. I can see everybody who was walking outside in Jannah, who's on the stream, the rivers of milk, the rivers of honey, the rivers of khamr. That boy is drinking khamr. <laughs> that boy is drinking honey. That boy is drinking milk. He's playing here. We can see the mortal boys, Wildan and Mukhalladun. They are around them. We can see the apple trees and the pear trees. You just look towards them and then the pear comes to you. The apple comes to you. You don't even need to move your hand out like this. You just look towards it. SubhanAllah, it comes down. The branch lowers itself to you and then you take it like that. The believers, they meet in Al-Jannah. You will see all of this from your house. Two believers will come. They'll be reclining on their beds. They'll be looking at each other. How are you? Are you okay? Yeah, Alhamdulillah, I'm good. And you as well? You enjoying your time in Jannah? Yeah, Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. After all that happens, you want to go visit someone else. So what happens is Allah says in the Quran that they are facing each other. They are facing each other. So the scholars of Tafsir, they say that when they want to depart, you want to go somewhere else, he wants to go somewhere else. Are they going to now turn their backs towards one another no each one his bed is going to take him into the sky fly away and then they're going to keep looking at each other into the distance until both of them disappear this is al-jannah this is al-jannah every single thing that your soul is desiring it is craving what your heart beats for, every single thing that your eyes feel coolness and comfort in looking at, Allah will give it to you. وَأَنْتُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ And you will remain in there forever and ever. وَتِلْكَ الْجَنَّةِ الَّتِي أُورِثْتُمُوهَا بِمَا كُنْتُمْ تَعْمَلُونَ لَكُمْ فِيهَا فَاكِهَةٌ كَثِيرَةٌ مِنْهَا تَأْكُرُونَ جَعَلَنِ اللَّهُ وَإِيَّاكُمْ مِنْ أَهْلِ الْجَنَّةِ طيب. So if we don't start with the topic, then we're going to get carried away with that. That was meant to be the introduction. And with myself, uh, when I'm invited and the masajid, they think good of me. I'm not a speaker. I'm definitely not a qualified teacher, that's for sure. But I generally like to speak about the topics pertaining to the akhirah and the greatness of Allah. Because this is the essence of our creation, why Allah even created us in the first place. And because we live in the dunya, if we're not reminded about these things, we tend to forget because we see the tangible, temporary things, so we forget about that which is permanent and everlasting. As for this topic, then this topic is entitled having hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this maddah, this term hope, it is an action of the heart. And in Arabic, it is known as al-raja. It is known as al-raja. And it's not very accurate to just say Ar-Raja means hope. Ar-Raja, hope, it means having hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for something practical whilst carrying out the necessary means. So if you want to memorize that, I'll say it a second time. Ar-Raja, this madda, this term hope, it means having hope in Allah. So there's three parts to it. The first part, having hope in Allah. So you don't have hope in anyone else, you have hope in Allah. The second part is for something practical. The third part is whilst carrying out all of the means that you can. So let's put this into practice. If somebody comes and says, I wish I was a Sahabi. Oh, I hope to be a Sahabi. Is this something that is practical? Can they carry out the means to be a Sahabi? Can anyone do that? No. So can you have hope in this particular thing? No, you cannot. So this is why we say this is the actual definition. Because if you just say hope, then people will hope for different things. You find an old brother, he'll say, I hope I was 20. I wish I was 20 again. Yeah, you've done that time. Now you're 40. You are 40 now. You can't go back to 20. You can only go 50 and 60 and up and up. Having hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for something practical whilst carrying out the necessary means. So we discussed the middle part which is practical. And we gave examples of impractical things like being a sahabi and wishing to be somebody who is younger, uh, of a younger age. The last part which is carrying out the necessary means. For example, if one of you here says, or I'll just ask a question and you can raise your hands. Who here wishes to be a hafid of the Qur'an? A hafid of the Quran. There should be no hands which are down. <laughs> Every hand should be up. My hand is up, and you, all of your hands should be up. Okay, one brother sleeping. That's fine. <laughs> Everyone, Jamil Jiddan. 
So, having hope in Allah, you're going to have hope in Allah for you to become a hafiz. That's the first part. Fine. Is it something practical? Yeah, it's something practical. Tayyib, the last part. If you come to me and say, can you give me advice? You memorize the Quran, tell us how you did it. I also want to do it. And then I explain it to you. And then I come back to Masjid Al-Furqan next year. And then you tell me, can you give me advice? I want to know how to become a hafiz of the Quran like you. The first question I'm going to ask is, you asked me that last year. And I told you what to do. Did you do anything in the meantime? This person didn't do anything. So the last part is missing now. Which is, he hasn't exhausted any means. You can't just sit there and just say, I hope to be a hafiz of the Quran. You're not going to become a hafiz of the Quran like that. This is what ar raja is. You have hope in Allah for something practical and then you carry out the necessary means. The scholars, they say, if the last part is missing, which is carrying out the necessary means, the asbab, they say, this is a tamanni. This is wishful thinking. I want to be a hafiz. I want to have a lot of children. I want to have a big house. I want to have a nice car. He's not even doing anything. He's just sitting in the same place. So you're not going to receive anything. This is not a raja This is called a tamanni. So firstly, we have now given a ta'rif, a definition to a raja What is the opposite of raja Huh? Al-khawf. What else? Despair. I want the word despair. Despair in Arabic. Al-yas. Al-yasu. Like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran in many places. Wa la tayyasu min rawhillah. Innahu la yayasu min rawhillah illa al-qawmul kafirun. Al-yas. It is the opposite of al-raja. Which is not to have any hope. It is to have despair. And the scholars of Islam, they say this is from the major sins. If you have despair in the mercy of Allah. If you don't hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're just, you've just given up. They consider this to be from the major sins that the Muslim can fall into. After understanding now the opposite of it, what are the different types of raja, having hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that are praiseworthy? And which ones are not praiseworthy? We will divide it into three and we will say there are two types which are praiseworthy. It's a good type of raja. And there's another type of raja which is bad. The first one is, you do a good action. And then when you do a good action, you are hoping in Allah, so raja, that Allah will accept it from you. And this is absent with a lot of people. Alhamdulillah, you came to the masjid, you offered the prayer. Alhamdulillah, you are sitting in a circle of remembrance. Alhamdulillah, you have given sadaqah. Alhamdulillah, 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 you've done a lot of things. But at the end of the day, you can't make your own actions accepted. You can carry out the action, but you can't make your actions accepted, can you? Allah is the one who accepts. إِنَّمَا يَتَقَبَّلُ اللَّهُ مِنَ الْمُتَّقِينَ And Allah only accepts it from the pure people. If it's only for his sake, if you are a muttaqi, if you have it, only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will accept it. Otherwise, he will not. So if you do a good action, you have hope in Allah that he will accept it. وَهَذَا لَا يَكْفِي And that's not sufficient. You also are fearful that Allah may not accept it. You have to have both. Like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he speaks about the khullas, the elite human beings, the greatest servants of his in the Quran, he says, وَيَرْجُونَ رَحْمَتَهُ وَيَخَافُونَ عَذَابَهُ وَيَرْجُونَ رَحْمَتَهُ وَيَخَافُونَ عَذَابَهُ وَيَرْجُونَ They are hopeful for His mercy. وَيَخَافُونَ And they are fearful of His punishment. You have to live like that as well. Aisha رضي الله تعالى عنها She spoke to the Prophet ﷺ Ya Rasulullah These verses, particular verses from Surah Al-Mu'minun Who are they speaking about? إِنَّ الَّذِينَ هُمْ مِنْ خَشْيَةِ رَبِّهِمْ مُشْفِقُونَ وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ بِآيَاتِ رَبِّهِمْ يُؤْمِنُونَ وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ بِرَبِّهِمْ لَا يُشْرِكُونَ وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْتُونَ مَا آتَوْا وَقُلُوبُهُمْ وَجِلَةٌ أَنَّهُمْ إِلَى رَبِّهِمْ رَاجِعُونَ أُولَئِكَ يُسَارِعُونَ فِي الْخَيْرَاتِ وَهُمْ لَهَا سَابِقُونَ Who are these people that Allah is speaking about in this surah? Their hearts are trembling because of the actions they did. Aisha رضي الله عنها, she said, Ya Rasulullah, are they the people who committed indecent haram 
relationships. They did zina. They fell into that. Is it those people? Because when you do zina, why is zina haram? Zina is haram firstly for many reasons. But why do people hide zina? This is what I'm trying to say. They hide zina because this is something which, I may Allah protect everybody from that. It, it's something which it doesn't bring the people's happy. It just people just look down towards you and people just think about you in a different way and they look lowly towards you, etc. And the opposite to that, it is al-nikah. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ, he said, أَعْلِنُ nikah Establish the nikah, announce the nikah, tell everybody about the nikah, don't hide your nikah, make it something which is public news. Because zina, you hide it. So because nikah, it is halal, you do the opposite thing. And now you showcase it and you tell everybody. Correct? So she said, is it these types of people who do these types of haram? The Prophet ﷺ said, no. The people whose hearts are trembling, they are the people who are doing good actions. They are doing good actions and so their hearts are trembling. I ask you all a question now. Don't raise your hand. Some questions when I ask them, I want to answer. Some questions when I'm asking, I just want everybody to be in a state of thought and wonder. Just to think about the situation, I'm also going to think. We just prayed Salatul Maghrib. How many of us, after praying Salatul Maghrib this evening, felt that trembling in their heart? It's a question. I'm asking myself firstly, and I'm asking everybody else secondly. You did a good action. Did you feel anything? Allah knows the reality, but it could be the case that nobody in this hall felt that. So if that's the case, then look at where we are, and look at where we're meant to be. Look how far we are. Ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, the son of Umar ibn al-Khattab, he used to say, if I knew that one good action was accepted from Allah, I will wish death upon myself. I'm ready to meet Allah. Just one. Just one good action. What he means by that is, I've got to keep working hard and I've got to keep hoping in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he will accept my actions because I, I genuinely don't know. And if you're not like this, you haven't fulfilled this action of the heart called ar -raja. So you do the good action, you are hopeful that Allah accepts it, and you are fearful that Allah rejects it. This is the first one, and this is praiseworthy. The second type of raja, it is that you fall into a sin. After you fall into the sin, you repent to Allah. And this is what you're meant to do. The Prophet says, as soon as you do the bad, do the good. It will wipe it out. As soon as you do the bad, feel regret, ya akhi, feel remorse. And nadamu tawba, the Prophet said. This state of regret itself, it is an expiation. You'll be forgiven. It is Toba itself. But if you just do bad and you do bad and you do bad and you do bad, the Prophet ﷺ explained that this heart of yours, this heart of yours, the nur that I had is going to disappear. A black dot is going to be placed and then another black dot is going to be placed and then another black dot is going to be placed until the entire heart becomes black. And this is a type of cover on the heart. So the person, he doesn't see any good. He doesn't see good to be good. He sees good to be bad. And then he sees bad to be good. And maybe some of us know people like that. SubhanAllah, we call them to good. We invite them to good. We're trying to help them out. They don't want to be in the places of good. They just want to be in their own places. And the opposite. The opposite. People who cannot stay in a bad place, they only want to be in the places of khair and goodness and purity. This type of covering, it is the highest type of covering. The scholars of Islam, they refer to it as Arran. And it's in the Quran. كَلَّا بَلْ رَانَ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِمْ مَا كَانُوا يَكْسِبُونَ كَلَّا إِنَّهُمْ عَنْ رَبِّهِمْ يَوْمَئِذٍ لَمَحْجُوبُونَ رَانَ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِمْ This covering of the heart is so thick. It's so thick. Nothing can penetrate through the heart when this ran is there. Allah says in the ayah after that, because they have this type of covering and their heart is completely sealed on the day of judgment, Allah will protect himself from them and they won't be able to see Allah a veil will be placed and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not be seen by these people there's a hijab between them and Allah because of the ran that is upon their hearts all of this came from a person persisting in sin you are going to sin and you are going to fall down and you are going to make mistakes لكن التوبة التوبة repentance to Allah so this second person, he has fallen into a sin. He has done the tawbah. Now he is hopeful that Allah is going to accept his repentance. This is also a praiseworthy type of raja and hope. Because 
when you make a mistake and then you make tawbah, خلاص, you're not meant to have a lot of doubts. You're meant to understand that Allah will, so long as you did your part and you fulfilled the conditions of tawbah, خلاص, Allah will accept it from you. So this is also something which is praiseworthy. The third one, it is something which is bad. It is a person who has fallen into a sin. And this person, he has not made tawbah. Now he has raja. Ayy raja, ya akhi. He's fallen into a sin. Lam yatub. He hasn't come with tawbah. Wa yarju min rabbihi an ya'fu anhu wa an yatub alayhi. That Allah forgives him, Allah makes his slate clean and then he's placed into Jannah. Jannah is ghali. The Prophet said, Ala inna sil'ata Allahi ghaliya. Ala inna sil'ata Allahi yal jannah. It is true that Jannah is going to be filled with sinners, like Allah mentioned in Surah Ali Imran. Those who done fawahish, walladheena idha fa'alu fahishatan, they committed the worst types of crime. They wronged themselves, ظلموا anfusahum. But Allah says they did the tawbah. They sought forgiveness. فَاسْتَغْفَرُوا And then they realized the only person who forgives is Allah. Allah said these people became the people of Jannah. So if you do a sin, and you don't repent to Allah, it's not befitting for you to have this type of mentality that you're just going to walk into Jannah. You have to be eligible to walk into Jannah. To get this particular job, you have to be eligible. To study in this particular institute or establishment, this university, you have to fulfill the requirements. Nothing in this world is for free. <laughs> Nothing. And I'll tell you that for free as well. Nothing's for free. SubhanAllah, I was just telling the brothers we came here. And um, this is just uh, to lighten the mood. And then I paid for my petrol last night. I knew I was coming to Manchester from London. I paid 70 pounds for a full tank. Now it's nearly finished. Just this trip to here. So things are really expensive. You have to always give. You have to give to get. That's how life is. Jannah is the same. Jannah is not just for you. You don't, you don't have like a place waiting for you if you don't work for that place. And why do the believers seem to think that it's just Jannah, Jannah, Jannah. The Prophet ﷺ, when he would be with the Sahaba, he would speak about Jannah and he would speak about Nar and he would explain how both of them are realities. People are going both ways. Fariqun fil Jannah wa Fariqun fil Sa'ir. One of them would say, Oh, Messenger of Allah, we would be with you and you would speak about Jannah and your speech will penetrate and it will hit the hearts. You will speak about Jahannam and we will also be affected. Oh, Messenger of Allah, this will be to a level as if we can see Jannah right in front of us. There it is. And we can see Jahannam over there. We can see it in front of us meaning our iman has gone to this level and then when we go home to our families we will mix with our families and our children and our wives and we'll forget Allah like I said before the dunya does this to you from the sahaba who said this was Abu Bakr Siddiq imagine the greatest man after all of the anbiya Abu Bakr Siddiq he came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Ya Rasulallah he came along with another companion called Hamdala. Hamdala, he said, Nafaqa Hamdala. Abu Bakr, he said, Nafaqa Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr has become a hypocrite. And Hamdala has become a hypocrite. And they are not talking about the hypocrisy of Iman. That's one type of hypocrisy. <laughs> they were mu'mineen. They are talking about a different type of hypocrisy, which is, O oh, Messenger of Allah, we are with you, and you are speaking about Jannah and Nar, and we are affected, our Iman is high. We go home, our Iman is not in the same place. The Prophet ﷺ, he told them two realities. He said, firstly, Sa'atun wa sa'a, an hour and an hour. Islam is not this abstract type of way of life where everything is just rules and regulations and ahkam and sujood and ruku' and qira'a and dhikr 24 hours, seven days a week. It's not like that. Even if you do this, it's not the way of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We know the famous hadith. One of the sahaba, Oh, Messenger of Allah, I'm going to pray all night. I'm not going to sleep a wink. <laughs> Never I'm going to sleep again. Another one, oh, Messenger of Allah, I'm going to fast every single day. Food and me, we're done. A third one, he said, oh, Messenger of Allah, all types of problems and mashakil, they come from women. You're not going to see me near another girl again. <laughs> he said this. The Prophet said, that's not my sunnah. That's not what Islam is about. He said, I... I have the most taqwa of Allah from all of you. I have the most knowledge of Allah from amongst all of you. And he said, I sleep part of the night, I pray part of the night. 
I fast some days, some days I don't fast. He doesn't fast every single day. This is why the Prophet Sallallahu he taught us that the greatest type of fast, it is the fast of Dawood Alayhi Salam. كَانَ يَصُومُ يَوْمًا وَيُفْطِرُ يَوْمًا He would fast one day and he would not fast the next day. So if you want to fast, and you want to fast a lot, you fast like the Prophet Dawood. One day, one day off. And as for women, he said, وَأَتَزَوَّجُ nisa." I get married to women. فَمَنْ رَغِبَ عَنْ سُنَّتِي فَلَيْسَ مِنِّي If you leave my way, you're not from me. So Islam is not like that. However, Islam has told you that you need to do the bare minimum in order for you to have a place reserved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for you in al-Jannah and for you to be freed from Jahannam. If you don't do this, then don't think that you're just going to be given it by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have to be eligible for it. And perhaps insha'Allah ta'ala, without making the muhadara any longer, we can conclude with a qissa and a story. The great companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, he was from a Yemeni background. When he was on his deathbed, Ibn Abi Shayba, he mentions in an authentic chain that he gathered his children Abu Musa al-Ash'ari and he said Udhkuru sahib al raghif He said to his children Remember the story of the companion of the loaf of bread So the kids, they thought, who's that? Who's the companion of the loaf of bread? If I ask you guys now, you guys, who is that? Do you know? No, do you know? No, do you know? No, do you know? Do you know? Bahram. <laughs> Those kids didn't know as well. So they asked their father, who's the companion of the loaf of bread? So he said it was a man who lived before the time of our nation, before the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This man, he lived for more than 70 years. But it's mentioned in the story that 70 years was worship to Allah. He dedicated it to Allah. 70 years he was worshiping Allah. He used to come out of the area that he lived in once a year and go to the city and the town to meet the people of the town. So after worshipping Allah Jalla wa'ala for 70 years, after that, post 70 years, he went to the town to visit the people as normal and then he saw a woman and the shaitan beautified this woman for him. The shaitan beautified this woman for him so much that this man who worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for 70 years after that, he committed zina with that woman for seven nights consecutively. 70 years of worship. After that, seven nights of haram. Directly after. It is what I was talking about before. When you don't give importance to your heart, a covering will come. A seal will come. So you don't even know what you're doing until it's too late. This man, he woke up on the eighth day and it's like reality check. What did I do? What happened in the last week? But think about how long it took him for him to realize that. Why did it take seven days? Something must have happened. He never gave this ihtimam and this importance towards his heart. The heart is the most important limb of your body. And if you don't look after it, then the rest of you, the rest of your body has no goodness in it. This is what the Prophet Sallallahu says. وَكَلَامُهُ حَقٌ And his speech is the truth. So this is what happened to this man. After this, when he came back to a state of realization, he said, I don't know what I'm going to do to make up for this. 70 years of ibadah and obedience and ruku' and sujood, I have ruined it with seven nights of haram. So he said, wherever I go from today, every single step that I take, when I take it, I'm going to do a ruku' and a sujood. Because he's thinking like, I don't even know how to make this better. This is probably the only path that is open. When I take a step, a ruku' and a sujood. When I take the second step, another ruku' and another sujood. Until later on, the story mentions that he found himself in a dungeon, in a place where there was a monk. This monk, this one was the one who used to give the loaf of bread out. He used to give the loaf of bread to a set amount of people. 
six, seven people. He would give it to them. One, two, three, four, five, six. The next day, one, two, three, four, five, six. So this man who did the haram, whilst he was doing the ruku and the sujood with every step, he found himself with these people. And then what happened was, when the guy was giving out the monk the loaf of bread, he just took one by accident. But because he gives out six every day, there's a seventh man today here, and he's taken one by accident. One of the people that was meant to take it now doesn't have the bread. Do you get it? He said, where's my bread? Someone took my bread. Allahu Akbar. <laughs> so this man, he realized, subhanAllah, it must have been me. I took his bread by mistake. He gave back the bread. The qissa continues, but now we get to the end. It's mentioned on the day of judgment. This is authentic. It has an authentic chain. The 70 years of good deeds was placed on a scale with the seven nights of haram. I ask you guys a question. What do you think outweighed? Which one outweighed the other one? The 70 years of ibadah or the seven days of haram? Just raise your hands. Raise your hands. Yes. The seven days of haram. Absolutely right. Seven days of haram wiped out a lifetime of ibadah. Lifetime. What was the hadith who can tell me that I mentioned right at the start about the lifespan of the ummah? Between what age and what age? 60 and 70. And he lived for how many years? 70 years of ibadah. 70 years is all gone, cancelled with seven days of haram. After that, the seven days of haram were placed on a scale with the good action he did, which is give back the loaf of bread. What do you think happened there? Allahu Akbar, the loaf of bread outweighed the seven nights of haram. And this is the qaida and the maxim that our religion teaches us. Do good, do more good. If you do one good deed, don't leave it there. Do more. فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ فَانْصَبْ If you are free and you are available and you have time and you have clearness, do more good deeds. That's in terms of good followed by good. And the hadith teaches us that if you do bad, then do good after it. وَأَتْبِعِ السَّيِّئَةَ الْحَسَنَةَ تَمْحُهَا if you do bad, then do good after it. So this man, he did good, then he did bad. And then he did good, and then it was wiped out for him. And then he became from the people of Jannah. So I will conclude my lecture here, inshallah ta'ala. And our Shaykh, hafizahullah ta'ala, has arrived. And I'm very happy to see him, mashallah. And uh, if you summarize the lecture, I'll just say to you it was in three parts. So the beginning, it was the focus on the akhirah. And the journey to Allah, and we said the journey to Allah is a journey by the heart. It's not a journey on foot. Everywhere that you travel to in the dunya, it is a journey by foot. Everywhere. Even if you are riding in a car or a vehicle, you have to, ride, you have to walk towards the vehicle. But the journey to Allah is a journey of the hearts. And we spoke about that. Then we gave the introduction to Ar-Raja. We gave the ta'rif of it. We mentioned the opposite of it. After that, we mentioned that which is mentioned in Islam, the praiseworthy type of Raja, and that which isn't allowed. And then after that, we concluded with this qissa. Wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته First of all I would like to uh, praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I also would like to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, for blessing us uh, with the opportunity to, to have with us Alhamdulillah and Sheikh Jamal Abdul Nasir, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve him, say Ameen. And Alhamdulillah, we love our stars and that's why we invite him uh, so regularly. And as you know, only two weeks ago he was here with us and where he has delivered a very, very beautiful uh, khutbah. And just before that, he was here with us, delivered a beautiful talk. And here we are tonight, mashallah, he's with us. And Alhamdulillah, he delivered another beautiful lecture. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward him greatly. Say Ameen. And last week, this time last week, he was in Green Lane Masjid. And mashallah, he has delivered another beautiful talk. And I have listened to the, to the talk, all of it, mashallah. And I was enjoying every moment of it, mashallah. And Jazakallahu khairan. And the Sheikh so confidently last week, he was talking about, uh, <clears throat> and he was asked the question regarding the Quran. 
And uh, is it possible, for example, for someone to read the whole Quran in just one night? Because he mentioned the story. Look, and now the Sheikh knows I have listened to the lecture, you know. <laughs> I wasn't just claiming that I've listened to the. <laughs> he was asked this question. And how is it possible for somebody to read the whole Quran in just one night? And he explained that. And he did it so well. And he practically did it as well. Yeah. He practically showed us how is it possible for somebody to finish the whole Quran in just one night. Do you want to know? Do you want to know how to do that? Shall we tell you the secret? Did you listen to the lecture? You listened to the lecture of the Sheikh? Last week's lecture? You see, you've got so many fans here. <laughs> mashallah, mashallah, beautiful. So Alhamdulillah. And so we were, we are following the Sheikh Jazakallah Khair, uh, Sheikh Jamal. May Allah Subhanahu wa Taala preserve him. Allahumma Amin. And so, Shallah Taala, what we're gonna do now? And before I move on, and first of all, I want to apologize to the Sheikh. I wasn't here with you uh, for Salat al Maghrib, and I didn't pray behind you, and I was busy, and I was uh, taken from the Masjid uh, around 5:30 in the afternoon. I was at. Uh, I went to the university tonight and there was a program that was happening there and uh, alhamdulillah I just delivered a short reminder and I I led the salah salat al maghrib and uh, the brothers mashallah and the sisters were there and in MMU mashallah Manchester Metropolitan University that, uh, that's where I was tonight and I was I was occupied with that so that's why I wasn't able to be with you but alhamdulillah Ustaz Luqman who's here was looking after you mashallah and he did the uh, alhamdulillah the introduction may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward him greatly for that so inshallah ta'ala now I'm going to give you opportunity to ask the Sheikh a couple of questions regarding the talk okay has anybody got any question inshallah ta'ala regarding the talk yeah. Okay, we'll you will come back to you. Brother Abdul Rashid has got a question. Mashallah, very good question. What's the best way of taking care of our hearts? <clears throat> Uh, Bismillah. So, what you ask for is another lecture, basically. So it's not answer to a question. There are many ways to do that, but just one way, inshallah Taala, very quickly, is the heart. There are pathways to it. So, if you protect those pathways, what leads to the heart, then inshallah Taala, you will be able to protect your heart. So, for example. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, قُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ يَغُضُّوا مِنْ أَبَصَارِهِمْ وَيَحْفَظُوا فُرُوجَهُمْ ذَلِكَ أَزْكَى لَهُمْ And say to the believing males in the ayah after the believing females is also mentioned, for them to lower their gazes. This is more purer for them. Purer, this is talking about the heart. This will purify your heart. When you lower your gaze, of course it purifies your heart. It protects your heart. It brings goodness to your heart. And when you don't do that, the opposite happens. So this is one way. Now we are told through this ayah that Make sure you protect your eyes. If you protect your eyes, you'll protect your heart. Similarly, your ears. You protect your ears from listening to that which is unlawful, that which Allah hates, that which the deen and the religion detests. You'll protect your heart as well. Also, protecting your limbs from being in places which are not good for you as a Muslim. So you do not find yourself in bad gatherings. All of this will protect your heart. If you go to places which are bad, it will pollute your heart. So to answer your question briefly, it is the pathways to the heart, the other limbs protect them and you will protect your heart, insha'Allah ta'ala, wallahu alam. Allah, jazakallah khair. And any other question? Mashallah, the young brother, yes? Yes. Okay. It's just the pressure. Abdurrahman, yes? Yes, so he said that when you are in Jannah or when you are in your grave, a window, we mentioned there's a hadith that mentions a window will be open where you can see Jannah. And the bad people, a window will be open for them for Jahannam. So does it mean that there are people who are in Jannah before you and then you are going to be there later? Or does it mean that the believers, they will all enter into Jannah one time? 
some people they get confused with this because the Prophet sallallahu at different times he will say to different companions, I have just heard your footsteps in Jannah. Does anybody know, before I continue my answer, who, yes, Bilal, someone said already, Bilal. This is an authentic report as well. So they're on earth and he's telling him, I've, I've heard your footsteps in Jannah. He's saying this to him. Or we have other reports that mention that some people are already in Jannah. They have built their, you say a specific dhikr. Okay, another question. If you say a specific dhikr, a specific uh, tree will be built for you. What is that dhikr? Huh? Subhanallah. Okay, Jameel. So with this, a window will be open for you in Jannah. Will you actually see the believers who are there before you? Wallahu alam. As in, we don't know how the unseen is going to be exactly. It could be the case and it also may not be the case. Like the Prophet ﷺ reports that Allah said that he has prepared for his righteous slaves that which no eyes have seen, that which no ears have heard, and that which no minds can comprehend. We can't really comprehend the reality of these things and Allah knows best. Yes, brother. Mashallah. What's the best way to do tawbah? <clears throat> what is the best way to do tawbah? So, do you mean in terms of the actual tawbah? Do you mean in terms of the etiquettes? Do you mean the time? What do you mean by best way? Jamie. So, no doubt, tawbah is an act of worship that you are doing so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can forgive you. If you make dua, dua is a very powerful way of asking Allah to forgive you. But a more powerful way, for example, there's two rak'ah called rak'atain tawbah, by the way. We all know this. You can do this. You can also ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the prostration. There are different ways you can do it. The main thing for tawbah is that it is a sincere, true tawbah and it fulfills all of the conditions that Islam has set. After this, inshallah ta'ala, the best type of tawbah is the one where you are completely sincere in it. Like Allah describes, tawbatan nasuha. It's a sincere tawbah. It's a tawbah that you are truthful in. And this will be considered the best, inshallah. And Allah knows best. Okay. And yes, Hassan, now I'm sure that you will remember your question. Yeah. What's the question, Hassan? Okay, you got the question, the gist of the question, the gist of the question, okay. What do you have to do to get there? You have to... Sorry about that. You have to be the best Muslim possible. You have to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as much as possible. You have to do everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to do. And inshallah ta'ala, if you do that, that will be you. That's it. It's not difficult. You have to just be, what did I say? The best Muslim. If you are the best Muslim, inshallah ta'ala, you will have that opportunity bi idnillahi ta'ala. Yes, this young brother as well. Interesting. Before Jannah, did he say? Did he say before? What did he say? Before Jannah or in Jannah? Did he say before? Before Jannah, are you going to be placed in the body of green birds? That's what you said, right? These types of reports they exist, but not for everybody. Not for everybody. Certain people have been mentioned, like the martyrs and the shuhada. They will be in that state. Um, so not everybody, but if you want to be that in Jannah, then perhaps you can be that in Jannah. But when you go to Jannah, you won't think about being a bird or <laughs> being an eagle. Or you won't think about this. You will enjoy your time in Jannah so much that you will think you have the best thing that anybody could possibly have. And then every single day that you're there, you're only given more and more and more and more and more. It's not something that you can really fathom and understand. But may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take you to Al-Jannah, young man. 
Mashallah. And we've got a couple of questions from, from, from our brothers who are following this talk and uh, via YouTube. And uh, one of the questions says like, uh, which actions move our hearts closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And what practical steps can one take to memorize the whole Quran at home? That at home, yeah? And, and how does one become a wali of Allah? I think each one will require a lecture. Yes. <laughs> I'll start with the last one. The last one, the khutbah that was delivered in Masjid al-Furqan by myself a couple of weeks ago was on that topic. So you can refer back to that insha'Allah ta'ala. With regards to the second one, which was how to memorize the Quran at home. I forgot the order. Memorize the Quran at home. Really and truly, you can memorize the Quran wherever you are. You can memorize the Quran in the masjid, you can memorize the Quran at home, you can memorize the Quran whilst you are traveling. A lot of the ulama of the past, they have authored their works. A lot of the works that you see from various ulama, they will write in the actual work. And I wrote this on a journey between Mecca and Medina. And I wrote this on a journey between Basra and Kufa. And I wrote this on a journey from Asham to Mecca. They will write things like this. So people are memorizing things. People are authoring things. People are benefiting the Muslims whilst they're traveling and on journeys. So firstly, you can memorize the Quran wherever you are. But there are ingredients to memorizing the Quran. First and foremost, you have to be a sincere talib and a seeker. Talib meaning one who is requesting and seeking. Allah is the one who gives the Quran. So you have to come with this sincerity. The second thing is that you have to dedicate a lot of time towards the Quran. The Quran is not just going to come at you very easy. Whilst it's an easy book, it's easy for the one who invests time. Invest time. You know with the brothers who, who likes wrestling, who likes boxing, they like this stuff. So we see the brothers when they are wrestling and boxing, boxing for example, sometimes they're in their room and they're not boxing with anyone, they're just doing this. Because they're practicing. They're investing time so they can become better and better and better. The Quran, you have to give time. Even when you're alone, when you are in your room, you are at home, you have to always read it. And the more you do this, the more you will become better at it, inshaAllah ta'ala. And the last ingredient for the Quran is you have to have a teacher. If you don't have a teacher who's teaching you the Quran, you won't be able to learn it, period. It's not possible. So if you have these three things and you're learning at home, you can learn at home. But if you don't have the teacher and you're learning at home, then you're going to struggle. So that's regarding that question. And the first question, Shaykh, let me see. How do you get your heart closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and which ways can you do it? There are many ways, but we will mention only one way. It is through the Quran itself listening to the Quran and pondering over the Quran and reflecting over the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions in the Quran that when the believers read the Quran, their iman increases. وَإِذَا تُلِيَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُهُ زَادَتْهُمْ إِيمَانًا Allah also says in the Quran, إِذَا تُتْلَى عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُ الرَّحْمَانِ خَرُّوا سُجَّدًا وَبُكِيًّا When the verses of Ar-Rahman are read upon them, they fall into a state of prostration whilst crying a lot. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says that their hearts soften and their limbs soften towards the dhikr of Allah. So how can you soften your heart? The greatest way is through the remembrance of Allah and the greatest type of remembrance, it is the Quran. Allah. And another question from, from YouTube, mashallah. And, uh, and can you give us what's the best tip to make your Quran strong when you are learning? Mashallah, very important, mashallah. A tip to make your Quran strong whilst you are learning. Uh, our ulama, they mentioned that there is no method which is easier than another method. And if you suggest this, this is something subjective that you're suggesting. You're suggesting a method which is easy for you. But if you present it, it may not be easy for me. I may say something to you today and say, all of you implement it. I'll be back next week and I will ask you, did you find it easy? Half of you may say yes, half of you may say no. So there's no true method which is easy and it is a blanket. It works for everybody. But what does work for everybody, it is the advice of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because if the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gives advice, it is an objective advice that will work for all people. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, I swear by the one who my soul, his hand lies in. I swear by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the Quran it escapes from your memory faster than camels do from a bonded rope. 
And then he mentioned the issue being people not reading the Quran a lot. So he said the solution is to read it a lot. Ta'ahadu hadha al-Quran. Fawalladhi nafsu Muhammadin biyadi lahuwa ashaddu tafallutan min al-ibl fi uqliha. Read the Quran a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. The more you repeat, it sounds like a textbook simple answer, but it really is the only answer. It sounds so easy, right? But a lot of us don't do it. I was telling brothers that were memorizing the Quran with me just this week. One brother came, he was we had a soft queue. I was sitting here, first one, second one, third one, fourth one. So he's in the queue, he's like the fourth or the fifth. When he came his turn, Yalla read. And then he looked at me. I said, I don't know where you're gonna start from. <laughs> you should know. I said, well, why did you come to the line if you weren't ready? He said, I was ready. So I said, what happened? He said, I'm just gone blank. So I said to him this, I said, once you memorize the page, so you memorize the page, right? After that, you repeat it another 50 times. <laughs> yeah. I don't like putting numbers on it. I'm just mentioning a number, for example. Me, I'm actually against people saying numbers. And I'm against all of these methods that people say, read the ayah five times and then next one five and then 10 or 15 or 20 or 50. I shouldn't have said 50 to be honest because I'm against that. But I mention it to him as an example. What I mean by 50 is a lot. I'm using it lit takthir, not uh, for tahdeed. I'm not uh, signifying in this number. You have to read it a lot. When you memorize, you read more. And then after that, you'll be able to remember the page. The easiest way to memorize the Quran, retain the Quran, never forget the Quran, it is katratu takrar, excessive repetition. And this is why it is said that a lot of the Sahaba, they used to finish the Quran every week. So what would they do? Seven days they will finish the Quran. The first day they will read the first three surahs of the Quran. They will read Surah Al Fatiha, they will read Surah Al Baqarah, they will read Surah Al Imran. The second day they will read the next five surahs. They will read Surah Al Nisa, Surah Al An'am, Surah Al A'rab, Surah Al Anfar, Surah Al Tawbah. The third day they would reach, they would read the next seven surahs Surah Yunus, Surah Hud, Surah Yusuf, Al Ra'ad, Ibrahim, Al Hijr. The next day they will read the next nine, and then 11, and then 13. And then the final day, the seventh day, they would read Al-Mufassal min Al-Quran. They would read the part of the Quran which is considered the Mufassal, the last four juz. They would find themselves on Surah Qaf and they would read towards the end. Some of the scholars, they say Al-Mufassal starts from Surah Qaf. And it will start from Surah Qaf if you start your counting from Al-Fatiha. And other scholars, they say it starts from Surah Al-Hujurat, and if you start your counting from Surah Al-Baqarah, then it will start from there. Whatever the case, Katratu Takrar, an excessive repetition, this is what will lead to the Quran being strong, and Allah knows best. MashaAllah, MashaAllah, Jazakallah Khair, and Shaykhana Jamal, any other question from the floor? MashaAllah Ta'ala, yes, young brother. Okay, the animals, where will they go? Are they going to go to Jannah? Are they going to go to Hellfire? Somewhere else? <laughs> That's a great question, mashallah. Allah bless you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He only created human beings and jinn for worship. Which means everything else they haven't been created for, worship. But they are the creation of Allah, like the animals, like the buildings, like the oceans, like the trees, like, like, like. So where do they go after? We know that the Prophet ﷺ, he said, he prophesied a long time ago. He said that the angel that is going to blow the horn when the hour is going to come and there's going to be global destruction and global death, he's already placed his lips on the horn. He's just waiting for the command of Allah. Allah will say, blow, he will blow, everything will be destroyed. And then after this, everything will also die as well, including the animals. But the Jannah, it only belongs to those who worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Would there be animals in Jannah? Yes. Everything is in Jannah. If you want to see an animal, meet an animal, you will find the animal there. But an animal that is in the farm in Manchester, is it going to go with you to Jannah? Perhaps not. <laughs> Okay, Jashallah, Jazakallah Khair. Any other question from the floor before we get? Mash. Yeah. Uh, Bana, how are you? Mashallah. Okay. Once, okay, you, you heard the question, Sheikh? I did, but I don't know. 
Okay. Say it one more time. Will the angels die? That's what you mean. Okay, so you got that. <laughs> I'm not sure with regards to that question. Yeah, the question seems like a very hard question. You thought a lot about it, and it's going to require me to think a lot about the answer as well. Okay, your question was too heavy. It's like it's quite, quite heavy, yes. Oh, mashallah. Very, very deep question. Inshallah ta'ala, hopefully we will try and uh, research. Yes, I research it, inshallah. Mashallah. Jazakallah khair. Okay, so we have uh, some questions from the sisters. And uh, the si one sister is asking how to stop listening to music. Very important question. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all from music and the brothers or sisters who may be struggling with it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow them to overcome their struggles. You always need a replacement. So if this is a habit, if this is something which you have a strong desire for, you're very connected to music. Some people may be. It's possible. You're connected to it. I'm talking about the person who's really, really connected to music. Some people, they may listen to it, but they can stop it. They're not really connected. Other people, music is like a big part of their life. Without music, they don't really like enjoy a lot of their life. Such people, they have to replace this music with something else. And what would you replace music with? Quran. So you are probably attracted to the music because most of the time, not because of what is being said. Maybe you just like the sound. Maybe you just like the artists and their voice. I'm saying perhaps. But the Quran, the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is the most beautiful thing. You know what the scholars they say? They say, Kalamul Arab. The speech of the Arab, it is nadhmun wa nathrun wa Qur'anun. It is poetry, and it is speech which is other than poetry, normal written speech, and it is Qur'an. So the ulama, they say the Qur'an cannot be considered poetry because it's not poetry. Nor can the Qur'an be considered normal works, that's just pages and pages of Arabic literature. The Qur'an is a third thing. The Qur'an is in its own remit. Nothing is like the Qur'an, nothing has ever been seen like the Qur'an. It has shook the world, it has shook the angels, the angels in the sky, when they hear Allah speak revelation, they're all unconscious, they drop down. So this has affected them. The Quran can also affect you. Begin listening to it. And just like you're addicted to some artists, maybe, if you are, I'm saying, then also find that qari for you. Everyone has a qari that they enjoy listening to. You may like a specific type of qari, you may not have discovered it yet, Make a search, inshallah ta'ala. Look on YouTube, listen to different reciters. Trust me, you will find one that appeals to you a lot. And with this, inshallah ta'ala, you'll be able to come away from the music. You'll find this more appealing and you'll leave it, inshallah ta'ala. Wallahu a'lam. Okay, mashallah, exactly. Khair, shaykhana. We're making a very tired tonight, mashallah. I hope you're enjoying these questions, mashallah. Uh, we are enjoying, mashallah, the answers to these questions. And a question that also comes from the sisters. If a, if a person feels like that they are that they have strayed away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and feels helpless how does one overcome this feeling as it constantly comes and causes extreme distress this sounds like something i mentioned in my lecture does anybody remember what was it so the question is saying that they feel a sense of hopelessness. It's causing them extreme distress and they feel like they're very far away from Allah. How do they move on from this? What was this that I mentioned in my lecture? Yeah. Despair. He needs a gift today. What's your name? Zakaria. But Zakaria, do you know the Arabic word that I mentioned for despair? If you mention that, you'll get two gifts. Before I come to you, I want Zakaria to say it if he knows. Yeah. Yes, khalas. Allah, khalas. Allah, Allah, I'm not going to give him Mishid al Furqan. I have to give him <laughs> the gift. <laughs> no, no, we have, we have the gift. We have, we, the have, gift. we have the gift. Alhamdulillah. 
So he's paying attention, mashallah. Perhaps some of the older brothers would not have remembered this. Aliyats. So our dear sister, it seems like this sounds like aliyats, hopelessness. You feel very far away from Allah. You're trying to come back. We mentioned that this is not something which is good. You're not allowed. We, this can be considered from the major sins of Islam. لا تقنطوا من رحمة الله so if you feel far away from Allah, you have to change your life, you have to repent back to Allah, you have to change your environment, you have to do what you can, and then after this, you have to stop this feeling. Now, stopping a feeling is easier said than done. If this is something which is coming to you all of the time, it's probably coming to you because you're thinking about it, overthinking it, and you're alone. And we have reports that it mentions that if a person, a believer, is by himself, he's very vulnerable. The wolf, it only attacks the lone sheep. You have to be in gatherings of khair and good people, righteous people, so that you come to terms with your situation and you realize that every single person sins and you repented to Allah. So long as you repented, you did the right thing. Don't feel the way you are feeling. And we know many narrations, and I'm sure she does as well. The man who killed 99 people, then he killed 100 people, and then he was forgiven. He killed 100 people, he's a murderer, old blooded murderer. But then he was forgiven by Allah. You didn't do any of those things. You did maybe things which are much less than this. So repent and then turn back to Allah and then remove this feeling from your heart, inshallah. And another question from the sister's side, how to pray tahajjud and when to pray it? Tahajjud or qiyamul layl, the night prayer. This can be prayed at any time from after Salatul Isha in the night time, yani, until just before Salatul Fajr. Some of the scholars, they do make a split between Qiyam layl and Tahajjud. Some of the scholars and others, they say it's the same thing. Some say that Tahajjud, it is when you wake up from sleep and then you pray. And others, they say Qiyam layl it could be done even if you haven't gone to sleep, so before sleep. So the time is that time. Any time in the night time, it is considered a night prayer. And that will be Qiyam layl or Tahajjud. What is the best time? The best time is the last third of the night. If you can pray then, this is the best time. SubhanAllah, you even see from the mercy of Allah and the ease of Islam. From your logic, when is the hardest time to pray Qiyamul Layl? You tell me. Is it the first part of the night? If we split the night into three, is it the first part? Is it the middle part? Or is it the last part? What would be the hardest? If you say middle, raise your hands. If you say last, raise your hands. If you say start, raise your hands. I don't know why the older generation said uh, the last one. The shabab are correct. <laughs> the middle is the hardest. Because you start the sleeping and then you're in a good time in your sleep. You have, you're having nice dreams, you're seeing different things and you're enjoying your sleep. So to wake up earlier or to wake up later, let me rephrase the question. What is easier, to wake up quick and leave that state or to sleep a little bit longer and then wake up later? Sleep a little bit longer and wake up later. And Islam is telling you, this actually works for you. It suits your routine. And it is the better time to pray and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a time that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descends in a way that befits His majesty. This is the greatest time to pray. Wallahu alam. Allah, jazakallah khair. Inshallah, another question from the sisters. And you mentioned that we need to do the bare minimum to be able to earn Allah's pleasure. Is that only the obligations in Islam? Or do some voluntary acts fall under this as well? So, entering into Jannah, there are reports that state that if a person does the bare minimum with the obligatory actions, and they do voluntary actions here and there, but they focus on the obligatory actions, then they will enter into paradise. A man, he asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, O Messenger of Allah, if I establish the obligatory prayers, I fast the month of Ramadan, I do halal, I stay away from haram, will I enter into paradise? And he said, yes, you will. He never mentioned if I memorize the Quran. He never mentioned if I build a masjid. He never mentioned if I do X, Y, and Z. He mentioned specific things. And based on those specific things, the Prophet ﷺ, he said, yes, you will enter into Jannah. Or the other hadith, Man sarrahu an yandura ila rajulin min ahlil jannati fal yandur ila hadha. The one who wishes to see a man from the people of Jannah, let him look at this specific man. And this specific man was a man who was doing the bare minimum, but he had religious commitment. So it's not only about doing minimum and just being happy with the minimum. The believer is not happy with the minimum. 
but you have to be somebody who's doing it with ihsan and doing it perfectly and making sure that you do it in a way that pleases Allah and with this inshallah ta'ala you will be from the people of Jannah with Allah's permission yes brother Inshallah, any tips for attaining khushu' in salah? Similar to the question I was asked before by the brother who was sitting right beside you, he's gone now, Abdul Rashid. Uh, this also is a muhadara, how to attain khushu'. It's not an answer for a Q&A. But we'll try to give perhaps one or two points, inshallah ta'ala. From the great ways that one can attain khushu' is that they come with a lot of isti'dad before the prayer. So it's important for the believer, if they are able to do so, to come to the masjid before the time of the prayer, sit in the prayer space, do the two rak'ah for tahiyyatul masjid, be in a state of dhikr, be in a state of dua, be in a state of remembrance, and then the iqama is called, and then in that state you now enter the prayer. It's like when you're going for a football match, there's always a warm-up. You have to get your body ready. So just like that, if you get your heart ready, almost it's going to be like confirmed that you will have khushu' in that prayer. But a lot of us, we just come into the masjid, blah, 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 come to say, Allahu Akbar. You're not going to really find a lot of khushu'. Your mind is still in the market. Your mind is still on the car. Your mind is still on what you're going to do afterwards. So this is the first way to come early to the masjid and to be in a state of remembrance. Another way would be, if there are things that you are doing around the time of the prayer, either before or after, try to clear those things before the time of the prayer comes. Because your mind wanders off like this. If you have nothing that is pending, then your focus will only be on the salah. So clear your schedule. Don't pray the salah, for example, and you have an appointment um, five minutes into the salah time or 10 minutes after the salah so you're only thinking as soon as it's finished i need to jump and leave you're not going to be very concerned about the salah you're concerned about your other affairs like some of the contemporary ulama they give an example with for example the woman she should not for example put food on the cooker for it to be prepared and pray salah thinking for example for example some food it takes a long time to cook maybe one hour it's a slow roast lamb or chicken or something like this so they put it on and then they go pray because they know that it's going to take a long time to be cooked but you're still distracted you still know that there's food on the cooker what if the child goes towards it what if it overheats etc 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 so make sure there's nothing pending this will also help with your khushu wallahu ta'ala okay inshallah ta'ala final final question hopefully from the sister's side and uh, the concept of istikhara and uh, how to pray Salat al istikhara and uh, how do you know that maybe the choice that you're going to make is just like the right one, inshallah. <clears throat> Salat al istikhara it is something which is legislated in Islam and it is guidance that you are seeking from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reach a specific decision. Now, Salat al istikhara it has been legislated that you pray two rak'ah and you make a dua as well and this dua for those who don't know you can find it in any dua book like uh, the fortress of a muslim the scholars they say that you don't necessarily have to do the two rak'ah so if you read the dua of istikhara this can also suffice but the better way no doubt is that you do the two rak'ah and then you do the dua as well so this is in brief of how to do istikhara as for how do you know if you made the right decision then there are loads of things that different people say some of these things are not authentic but something that all of the scholars they mention is that if the matter becomes easy for you and you can see the road for you to achieve this thing i want to for example move to another country i want to move to a muslim country so i'm making a istikhara if i should go to that country is it going to be good for me so after i've done the istikhara i see a lot of doors opening up i secure a house i secure a job Alhamdulillah, there are people that are waiting for me over there. This now is an indication that your istikhara, it is showing you that you made the right decision. And the ulama, they say the opposite. If you made the istikhara and then you find doors closing on you and the matter is very difficult, then this is an indication that it is not the right thing for you. This is the best thing to follow and Allah knows best. 
MashaAllah. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh Jamal, for those beautiful, MashaAllah, and answers, as well as, MashaAllah, the beautiful lecture that you have, MashaAllah, delivered. And our young students, where is uh, Zakaria? Zakaria Amir, who answered the question. He's going to be given, inshallah ta'ala, a prize. I think he, maybe he's gone upstairs. MashaAllah, his father, is he here? Abu, Muh Abu Muhammad, maybe he's not here, MashaAllah, but uh, is Abu Muhammad here? Zakaria is there, mashallah. Zakaria is going to be given a prize, mashallah. The Sheikh was very impressed with his answers. And inshallah ta'ala, we will definitely give, uh, give him, inshallah ta'ala, a prize tonight, in the light ta'ala, or tomorrow. But we will try and find something for him tonight, inshallah ta'ala. Jazakumullah khairan. And I want to thank all the brothers and the sisters who have attended this lecture. And also, let me take this opportunity to thank our media team. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward them greatly. Say ameen. Mashallah, always, alhamdulillah, uh, live streaming the lectures of our mashayikh when they come. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept that from them. And all of you, mashallah, who made the effort to come, those of you who have been very patient, mashallah, waiting, uh, mashallah, for the lecture, S mashallah, those of you who sat here since Maghrib time all the way to Isha, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you greatly. Just remember, you know, you came to the masjid, you prayed Salat al-Maghrib, you sat down until all the way to Salat al-Isha. What do you think was happening that time? The angels were making dua for you. Just imagine, the angels were making dua for you while you've been waiting. And you were absolutely in a state of Salah. You know, if you come to the masjid and you sit down and you wait from Salah to Salah, you are as if you are in a state of Salah. So for that hour and a bit now, you were in a state of Salah. Say, MashaAllah. Alhamdulillah, Allah has given you that blessing, you know. Uh, while other people were busy with other things, but alhamdulillah, you were in a state of salah from Maghrib to Isha. Alhamdulillah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept that from you. Allahumma ameen. So jazakumullah khairan. And now, inshallah ta'ala, we're going to be getting ready for Salat al Isha. And Sheikh Jamal is going to be leading, inshallah ta'ala, Salat al Isha, as we always do when he comes, mashallah, as he always does when he, come, when he comes to the masjid, be in the light ta'ala. And we want to see the Sheikh again in it. Am I right? Okay, we need to do our booking, inshallah ta'ala, as soon as we can. Jazakallah khair. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. akbar. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. ملك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين هو الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وجعل منها زوجها ليسكن إليها فلما تغشاها حملت حملا خفيفا فمرت به فلما أثقلت دعوى الله ربهما لئن آتيتنا صالحا لنكونن من الشاكرين فلما آتاهما صالحا جعلا له شركاء فيما آتاهما فتعالى الله عما يشركون أيشركون ما لا يخلق شيئا وهم يخلقون ولا يستطيعون لهم نصرا ولا أنفسهم ينصرون وإن تدعوهم إلى الهدى لا يتبعوكم سواء عليكم أدعوتموهم أم أنتم صامتون إن الذين تدعون من دون الله عباد أمثالكم فادعوهم فليستجيبوا لكم إن كنتم صادقين 
ألهم أرجل يمشون بها أم لهم أيدي يبطشون بها أم لهم أعين يبصرون بها أم لهم آذان يسمعون بها قل ادعوا شركاءكم ثم كيدوني فلا تنظرون إن ولي الله الذي نزل الكتاب وهو يتولى الصالحين والذين تدعون من دونه لا يستطيعون نصركم ولا أنفسهم ينصرون وإن تدعوهم إلى الهدى لا يسمعوا وتريهم ينظرون إليك وهم لا يبصرون خذ العفو وأمر بالعرف وأعرض عن الجاهلين وإما ينزغنك من الشيطان نزغ فاستعذ بالله إنه سميع عليم إن الذين اتقوا إذا مسهم طيف من الشيطان تذكروا فإذا هم مبصرون وإخوانهم يمدونهم في الغي ثم لا يقصرون وإذا لم تأتهم بآية قالوا لو لجت بيتها قل إنما أتبع ما يوحى إلي من ربي هذا بصائر من ربكم وهدى ورحمة لقوم يؤمنون وإذا قرئ القرآن فاستمعوا له وأنصتوا لعلكم ترحمون واذكر ربك في نفسك تضرعا وخيفة ودون الجهر من القول بالغدو والآصال بالغدو والآصال ولا تكن من الغافلين إن الذين عند ربك لا يستكبرون عن عبادته لا يستكبرون عن عبادته ويسبحونه وله يسجدون الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم ملك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين وكأي من آية في السماوات والأرض يمرون عليها وهم عنها معرضون وما يؤمن أكثرهم بالله إلا وهم مشركون أفأمنوا أن تأتيهم غاشية من عذاب الله أو تأتيهم الساعة بغتة وهم لا يشعرون قل هذه سبيلي أدعو إلى الله على بصيرة أنا ومن اتبعني وسبحان الله وما أنا من المشركين وما أرسلنا من قبلك إلا رجالا يوحى إليهم من أهل القرى أفلم يسيروا في الأرض فينظروا كيف كان عاقبة الذين من قبلهم 
ولدار الآخرة خير للذين اتقوا أفلا يعقلون حتى إذا استيأس الرسل وظنوا أنهم قد كذبوا جاءهم نصرنا فننجي من نشاء ولا يرد بأسنا عن القوم المجرمين لقد كان في قصصهم عبرة لأولي الألباب ما كان حديثا يفتر ولكن تصديق الذي بين يديه ولكن تصديق الذي بين يديه وتفصيل كل شيء وهدى وتفصيل كل شيء وهدى ورحمة لقوم يؤمنون